Hello, everyone. This week, we begin to discuss heroes in mythology. And our first topic is culture heroes. Now, before we begin discussing heroes in any kind of detail, I think it's important to ask ourselves a few central questions. The first is what or who is a hero to us? So there are various definitions of heroes that exist throughout psychology, throughout mythology, throughout anthropology, and in literature. And I think we do well to consider, we can of course keep all of those definitions in mind and we will come to them as we, as we go through this topic. But I think it's also important to consider what or who a hero is to us. So we want to ask ourselves the questions, what are the defining characteristics of a hero? And if we were to evaluate a hero based on a set of criteria for a kind of her heroic status, what would that set of criteria be? If we were to create a list, for example, that would define a hero, a list of qualities, characteristics, usually these are adjectives, what would they be? So things like they would be perhaps selfless, altruistic, confident, intelligent, and so on and so forth. Each of us, I think, has our own definition of a hero. And I think it's a good idea to examine that a little bit as we look at the heroes that show up in this section. So today our topic is culture heroes. And they are those heroes that are specifically important to cultures. Um, they are often agents of change. So whatever action the hero may take results in a large change for the culture. And this can be a material change. So it can be a lifestyle change that leads to a cultural change in a kind of cycle. And I'll give you some examples of that in just a moment. Or it could be a spiritual, a spiritual, a spiritual, <laughs> a spiritual change. <laughs> I'm not editing that out. <laughs> a spiritual change. Uh, that, you know, uh, some kind of enlightenment that again leads to a change in the culture going forward. Okay, so material or spiritual changes <laughs> now that we've got those right. So culture heroes are agents of those changes. Okay, so they are the individuals that take actions that bring those changes about. Sometimes they may bestow great gifts on humanity like teaching crucial skills, for example, or founding social institutions. Uh, they might rescue people from peril or, and or they may serve humankind in one way or another. So for example, they may bring light or fire to humanity as a gift. Perhaps they will provide the first food to humanity, again, as a gift. They may also provide instruction in things like hunting, farming, or healing, or in sacred knowledge or rituals or ceremonies. They may commit to acts of bravery, uh, self-sacrifice. They may confront monsters. They may dive into the depths, for example, of the primal waters to seek soil that's needed to create the earth. They might be the sole survivors of the flood uh, or the primal parents who repopulate the world. They might be warriors or they might be bold adventurers or a combination of the two <laughs> whose needs reflect the values of the people. 
So the actions of the warriors or the adventurers are a reflection of the values the people of that culture have. Heroes are representative in that way. They are the ideal of any given culture, or at least that's how they're represented. They may change the material conditions of people's lives, as I said, or they may change the spiritual conditions of people's lives, depending on their actions. So let's go through some examples here, okay? The first one, or the first gift that is often bestowed is fire. Now, most of us who are familiar with Greek mythology <laughs> uh, usually will think of Prometheus um, when we come to fire and Prometheus's gift of fire to humanity. This is the Greek example, but there are many other examples from other cultures as well. What does fire do? Fire improves the conditions of human lives. So if we think about fire, for example, as providing us with light, providing us with warmth, and also providing us with the capability to cook our food. This is a huge cultural change. So food goes from completely raw to being able to be cooked. If it's cooked, it can be kept for longer, it can be stored, it can be carried more easily, and so on and so forth. So bringing fire to humanity is not just a symbol, uh, but bringing fire to humanity is a recognition of its impact on human lives. So let's go through some examples here. Fire is often stolen by a trickster. So in the, the North America's Klama people, Coyote, he steals fire from thunder by cheating him at a game of dice. In the Polynesian tradition, Maui descends to the underworld to steal the burning fingernails of Mahui, Mahui Ike, sorry, keeper of the flames. In amongst the San people of Africa's Kalahari Desert, Kagni, I think it's pronounced, uh, the praying mantis steals the fire from under ostrich's wing. So ostrich has to keep his wings closed forever after. This is why ostriches don't fly because the wings have to be kept close to the body. Kagna is consumed by the stolen fire and then rises from the ashes, almost like, uh, like a phoenix would. In stories that we've already seen, in the Native North American tradition, the Onondagan tradition, Star Woman and her daughter bring fire and teach people how to hunt. In the Japanese tradition, we had Izanami and Izanagi, who were creator gods. Izanami brings birth to fire, but in the process, she burns her womb. And so she is no longer fertile because she gave fire to humanity. And so she builds a castle in the land of the dead. And that is where she ends up. So these are just a few examples of heroes who have brought fire to humanity. They may also bring light, water, night, or seasons. Uh, in many Native North American myths, the trickster Coyote brings light or water. In the myth told by the Miwok, he brings light. In the myth told by the Kalapuya, he brings water. And by the White Mountain Apache, he steals tobacco from the sun. Tobacco, of course, is necessary for ceremonies. So Coyote is the hero who brings it. You'll notice that so far there are quite a few tricksters who show up. And this is often because in order to acquire the gifts for humanity, they have to play tricks. <laughs> tricksters will come up for us in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, another trickster, Anansi, the spider trickster of Africa's Ashanti people. He notices that their lives are filled with never ending labor in the fields. 
So he climbs up to the heavens to consult with Nyame, the creator deity and ruler of the sky. And then Nyame agrees to create night so people can rest, so they don't have to labor all day, every day. Heroes, culture heroes may also bring food and technology to the people. And when we say technology, we don't mean computers, right? <laughs> we mean those material things that create changes in humanity's lives, lifestyles, cultures. In terms of food, culture heroes might introduce foods that are staples for society. So foods that are ultimately necessary for the survival of that culture, and that can be cultivated relatively easily in, in their geographic areas. They might teach people how to plant the food and to harvest it, or to hunt it and to kill it. So for example, the corn mother, um, which is a story that's told by both the Abenaki and Penobscot peoples. I believe for us in your textbook, it's, in, it's told by the Penobscot peoples. The corn mother sacrifices herself to give her gift, uh, which is corn. She, and the corn is the legacy that she leaves with the people. Um, the corn mother comes to her people in a time of starvation. And so she sacrifices herself in order uh, to provide the people with corn so that they won't starve. The Abenaki tale of the origin of corn includes a young woman with long, light-colored hair. She appears before a lonely hermit who lies dreaming in the sun. She tells him to burn a clear patch of earth, take hold of her hair, and drag her body over the earth. Over time, corn stalks appear, and the hermit can see the woman's silken hair in the plants. So if we imagine corn when it's fresh, and we take the leaves off the top, we can see that silken uh, part of the corn that looks like hair, and this is part of the story. Okay, so this is an example of food, bringing food a staple to a given culture. In terms of technology, fire is often viewed as a technology, so we could include fire in this sort of topic. Um, but we could also include things like making iron. And there are quite a number of blacksmith gods, yes? Um, amongst the Fawn of West Africa, the blacksmith Gu teaches people how to make tools of iron. In, China, in the Chinese tradition, Huang Di, the mythic yellow emperor, he's often called, uh, is honored for inventing the wheel and also the bow and arrow. And for teaching people how to write. And writing is viewed as a form of technology. In the Mayan tradition, the god Itzamna instructs people in writing. And if we are familiar at all with the Mayan tradition, it is um, the Central American, North Central American uh, indigenous tradition that has a very complicated writing system. So that's an interesting addition, I think. Culture heroes might also bring their communities, their societies, their cultures, knowledge. And here we sort of move out of the range of the material. So those physical aspects of our lives, fire, food, technology, that change our lives in very physical, very material ways, and into the realm of spirituality and gifts from heroes that might change our lives in more spiritual ways. Now, when culture heroes bring knowledge, that knowledge might be of material things. So it might be how to grow a crop, for example. And there are, are um, examples of this, but it might also be a kind of knowledge that simply advances relationships, for example, or um, f familial connections, okay? Some examples here, Fuji, who is a culture hero of Chinese myths, 
climbs the tree of heaven, Jan Mu, to seek pre precious gifts for his people. But in doing so, he also survives a devastating flood. In the stories of people from southern China, Fuji and his sister Nu Guo, and again, forgive me for my pronunciation if it's not correct, um, the two of them escape drowning in the flood created by Gong Gong, spirit of the waters, by creating a boat out of a calabash, which is a large kind of fruit that can be shaped into a bowl, or I suppose a boat. And then the two of them marry and give birth to a new race of people. Fuji is the only living being who is able to visit the celestial realm. By climbing Janmu, the tree that rises from the center of the world and links heaven and earth. He gains great wisdom. So this is the knowledge part. And then he comes back and teaches people how to make fire and how to harvest fish. So again, these are very material things, but it's the knowledge themselves itself. That is the important part here. Another example um, from the Chinese tradition, Shen Nong teaches people how to plow and plant the five grains and also how to use restorative plants and how to heal using herbs. In stories that we've seen so far from China in the cosmic yin and yang, a gold being who is called the gold one uh, taught the yellow one, man, again, these are labels in the story, yes, how to stay alive and also how to read the sky, which I think is interesting and probably worth further investigation. We're talking about stars here. We're talking about planets. It's interesting. In the story from India, Krishna Vishnu as Brahman. If you remember, we talked about the Bhagavad Gita, which is part of the Mahabharata, that very long epic tale uh, from the Indian tradition, or the Hindu tradition, I suppose. Uh, and in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives the warrior Arjuna knowledge, and he gives him the, what is called in your textbook, the celestial eye. And this knowledge is that we are all one. Yes spiritual knowledge here. And then of course this affects Arjuna's actions as he goes forward. In the Norse tradition from Iceland, uh, Odin, we haven't come to this story yet, but Odin gained knowledge through suffering from hanging from a tree for a very long time. <laughs> and then he brings this knowledge back to his people. Yes. Culture heroes might also bring sacred ceremonies or rituals uh, for their people to follow. Probably the best example that we've had of this so far is White Buffalo Woman from the Lakota Sioux tradition. She comes to her people again during a time of starvation and she brings sacred teachings and rituals to the people. This story, this myth in particular, is very instructional and detailed. <laughs> so she instructs her people to set up a sacred medicine tent with 24 poles, an altar of red earth in the tent for a buffalo skull, and a rack for a sacred object. She instructs them on how to use the sacred pipe and then she teaches them more about the pipe and the buffalo. At the end of the excerpt from the tale that we have, she rolls over four times and each time she turns a different color. The last time she becomes a white buffalo, which is the most sacred of all beings. It's after this that the buffalo come and they allow themselves to be killed, and then there is a time of prosperity. And the people wait for her to return and they look for a white buffalo. This story is of course uh, connected to indigenous lives previous to colonization, yes. 
And if we have any understanding of uh, particularly Canadian history, North American history, we know that the buffalo uh, soon were almost wiped out uh, from European influence, European hunting. So we can imagine a time of prosperity if natural cycles had been able to continue um, and an allegiance to the earth, an allegiance to the buffalo, a respect for the buffalo, perhaps the circumstances would have been different as White Buffalo Woman um, has laid out for us here. Another example of ritual or ceremony uh, gifted to us from culture heroes is of course Egypt and Osiris and Isis. Uh, the death of Osiris and the reassemblance of Osiris by Isis, who I would argue is really the hero of this tale, explains the ritual of mummification in Egyptian culture, certainly ancient Egyptian culture, yes. It was believed that everyone would live eternally if the same ceremonies followed in the myth of Isis and Osiris were followed for every Egyptian, ancient Egyptian person who died. And so each person who died bore the name of Osiris and the rituals of cer and ceremonies of mummification were carried out with the idea of bringing about eternal life in the afterlife. So that myth really establishes that ritual, that ceremony, that um, cultural tradition of mummification. Last but not least, culture heroes can be leaders, warriors, or adventurers. These are the, what shall I say, heroic myths that perhaps we are most familiar with. Yes, we may not think so much about the gifts that heroes might bestow, whether they be material or spiritual. Instead, we think about their adventures. And we've already talked a little bit about guardians, messengers, and monsters. So we need to remind ourselves in this moment that there are all those figures that exist within the myth, perhaps those creatures, those monster, monsters that show up, whose sole purpose really is to give the hero something to prove themselves with, something to conquer. What's also important to consider is that those monsters, for example, represent our greatest fears. And this is something that I've mentioned before, but I'll mention it again. When our fears are sort of unknown, undefined, uh, they may seem larger, much larger to us. But as soon as we can make them concrete and give them a physical form, then they become manageable. So we may have a great fear of the unknown, just like in uh, when we talk about the apocalypse. We have a fear, a great fear about how the world will end or how our lives will end. But as soon as we can write a story about that ending that has some detail in it, and we can create our own apocalyptic vision, then we can make it concrete and then it's a little bit less scary because there's a little bit less unknown. So the same is true of the monsters that the heroes come up against. They are sort of a material or a physical representation of our greatest fears because the unknown is scarier than the known. Leaders, warriors, adventurers are often acknowledged for their valiant deeds because they come up against these fears, these representations of our fears. Their behavior represents society's ideals, and we hold them up against high standards. They provide people with models of behaviors, and they represent our highest values. They also reinforce cultural traditions by reinforcing our communal, communal identity. So the community's identity is really wrapped up in the identity of the hero who is idealized and recognized as representing the culture as a whole. We'll look at many more examples of heroes in the next few weeks. <laughs>